All right, guys, good morning. It's time for Sunday morning Bible study. If you have your Bibles, turn over with me to Mark chapter 13. We are going to be looking at verses 1 through 13 this morning. Um, it is the uh, final installment of the Fast 15s for um, the blessing of community. Uh, this is number 8, and next week is Donut Week, and so we'll all be together uh, in the Family Life Center. We invite you to come and be a part of that if you have not before been a part of it. Um, then certainly you're invited. Uh, if you have, then you're excited about the donuts and, uh, of course, the Word of God. Uh, the blessing of being in community. Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you for loving and giving to us so graciously, so wonderfully. Lord, I, I could never deserve who you are, and yet you have chosen to love me. And that gives me infinite worth. And not only me, Lord, but you chose to love the world. That gives each human infinite worth, Lord. Not because of who we are, but because of who you are as God, as creator. And Lord, in these days, you have allowed us to assemble with your Holy Spirit in us, with your word in us, and to come together as a community of believers for support, for encouragement, to be challenged and then Lord ultimately to be changed from what the world would have us be to who you would have us to be Lord hope so father bless us as we go through this journey of scripture this morning Lord help us to see truth and to know truth most importantly father help us to know you better this morning and help us to know ourselves better we love you thank you for your word in Jesus name amen so we are looking at uh, Mark chapter 13, beginning in verse 1. As Jesus was leaving that temple, uh, the temple that day, one of his disciples said, Teacher, look at these magnificent buildings. Look at the impressive stones in the walls. And so, and so they're, they're leaving, and obviously, if you've ever been anywhere where there is um, man's handiwork, I love architecture. In fact, that was my first aspiration in life. That's what I wanted to be was an architect, not an engineer, but an architect. Uh, I love to design. I love to create uh, by design. And, uh, and so um, I, I just love architecture. I, I don't care what it is, uh, whether what style it is for the most part. Um, I, I just love architecture. I love the intricacies of it. I love the um, the, the things that are glaring. I love the things that are very, um, you wouldn't notice unless you were interested in that type of thing, uh, the subtleties. I, I just love it. And I think it's a marvelous and, and beautiful thing. So there's absolutely nothing. I want to say on the forefront of this, there's absolutely nothing wrong with appreciating things that men or, or people have created. Uh, artwork, uh, sculptures, um, electronics, whatever. There's there's absolutely nothing wrong with being in wonder of those things. I'm always, you know, I always think who who was the person that thought radio waves could go through the air unseen? I mean, they're all around us. Uh, radio, television, uh, all types of communication waves are all around us, and yet we don't see them. Uh, we can't touch them, can't feel them, but we can see what they do. And that's just amazing to me that someone's mind could conceive that. So I, so I don't want you to think this is a we shouldn't strive to do great things uh, lesson. It is not. Jesus is not rebuking them uh, for um, noticing a beautiful building. In fact, of course, this one is uh, the one Herod has, has created, but... Um, God himself was the creator of, of buildings and, and uh, great buildings. And so it's not so much um, the being impressed or being inspired and being awed by it. Um, the Jews have had, and, and still to this day, have a unnatural affection. Unnatural is a bad word. Have placed too much emphasis on a building and not on a God. And, and this is the, the thought that is coming out in the disciples. They're looking at the, and with amazement at what man has created for God. And, uh, and they say, man, just look how magnificent this building is. If we're not careful, though, 
will be more impressed with the creation than we are with the creator. Whenever I see great architectural wonders, I think, man, God, you made our brains so great that we could actually think of things like this. I don't think, man, we're, we're, we don't really need God. Um, that, that thought doesn't go through my mind. But, but if we're not careful, we will begin to appreciate and fall in love with the creation and not the creator. And then we've stepped off the path of righteousness and onto the path of death in, in some way because we have now misplaced our loyalties. Um, you know, if we can do this, then what do we need God for? And in fact, our culture is, is there in a lot of ways. We can do all these things. We can go to the moon. We can go to Mars and have a helicopter fly around. For goodness sake, who could do that? But we don't need, so we don't really need God anymore. And that is the danger of this type of thinking. Um, these, are, these are Jews um, that are following Jesus. Uh, obviously, Jesus is a Jew. And so um, they are very impressed with the architecture, the, the stone, how massive they are, as if this is something we can hold on to and this is something that will always be. You know, I'm sure that many people, perhaps millions of people, walk past the World Trade Center in awe. I mean, I did. I didn't walk past it, but I saw it in, in, many, um, in many movies and, and programs. I would see the World Trade Center, and it was a sense of pride for me. Man, look at what we can do. And, uh, you know, which, again, there's nothing wrong with that in the sense that, wow, God, thank you for letting us be able to create such marvelous things. But when we fall in love with the building, there's the temptation to not need God. And for these guys, they are all inspired by this magnificent temple. Maybe they're hoping Jesus will say to them, yeah, and it's not going to be long before we all move into it. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't know what the emphasis is, but Jesus says this, yes, look at these great buildings, but they will be completely demolished. In other words, that's something temporary. Guys, I have called you to the eternal Nothing wrong with looking and appreciating the temporal things, but I've called you to the eternal. Your mission is much greater than just some stones stacked on top of each other because your mission is live. These stones are dead. And, and what we find is sometimes people fall in love with things more than they fall in love with a person. People fall in love with an idea more than they fall in love with a person. And God's relational, and so he wants it to be about the relationship, not about the thing. The thing is okay. There's, no, there's nothing wrong. We can do the same thing with our church. We, we, have, we at Eastside have an incredibly beautiful facility. It's, it's in many ways a great, great blessing. In some ways it's a curse. We have to keep it up, and that's a lot of work, a lot of money. Um, but it's a great, great blessing. But if we're not careful, sometimes we will worship the building at the expense of the people. God didn't come. Jesus didn't come to save the temple. He came to save the Jews and ultimately us. He didn't come for a building. And, and that's what he's trying to get the guys to refocus on here is, or the, the disciples is, yes, that is a, an incredible building, but we have an incredible God who has an eternal mission, not a temporary, and this one is going to be destroyed. And, and in fact, we know 70 AD it was um, destroyed by the Romans, actually. Later, um, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives across the valley from the temple, so you could see it. The Mount of Olives and, and the temple are relatively the same height. Of course, there's a gouge in between, but relatively the same height. But you could see from the Mount of Olives the temple in Jerusalem because it was elevated. And um, so they're sitting there, and they're once again looking at the temple. And Peter, John, uh, Peter, James, John, and Andrew came to him. Now, the first four disciples that were called um, come to him privately and ask, tell us when this is going to happen. So this, this temple is going to be destroyed. That's what they've got in their mind. This, this temple can't be destroyed. 
tell us when, but they know Jesus, so they know for, for a fact that he knows what he's talking about. But this, this temple can't be destroyed. If you go to this area today, you're going to find that there's a Muslim uh, mosque on top, the Dome of the Rock, uh, where Muhammad supposedly got some uh, ascended, maybe. Um, there's it, right in the middle of the foundation. And, and that's really all that's there. And they have what's called the Wailing Wall. And people still go to that as if it's a god. And again, I'm not making light of, of their beliefs. And, and certainly not all of them have wrong intentions or wrong ideas when they go there. But many people do. And so the disciples say, when, when is this going to happen? In other words, now instead of getting diverted by the temporal temple... Now they're getting diverted by the temporal activities uh, and actions. So when is, when is this going to happen? Tell us, what's a sign that we can look for to know that this is going to happen? Because see, for the disciples, and this is, this is hard for us to understand because we, are, we know better, but they're living this, this, this word. They're living this one day at a time. Just as we're living our lives, we don't know what's going to happen in the next five minutes they didn't either and so they didn't have the beauty of the completed word of god like we do and so um they're looking at this tell us what's going to happen what's what's a sign and jesus says some interesting things but the gist of what he says is don't be distracted by signs by what people say by what people do trust me this is what it says don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic, don't worry. These things must take place, but the end is not immediate. See, see, the disciples thought that, well, first, they really couldn't grasp the fact that Jesus was going to die. They literally thought that now we're here at Jerusalem in just a few days, maybe tomorrow, Jesus is going to come in, he's going to absurd it, uh, Assert his, author, assert his authority, and uh, and we're going to be reigning with him in some some fashion. And then even as Jesus died, and then they they watched him go up. They literally believed, as as Paul's writings and uh, says or alludes to that he does as well, that Jesus is going to come right back. And when he comes right back, they're all going to rule. They, they couldn't see the 2,000 years plus in between. And, and you and I prob probably couldn't have seen that either. Uh, um, but, but it was there. And this is what it says. There will be many to deceive. There will be roars and rumors. War always has been, always will be. Don't panic. Um, Nation will go war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes, earthquakes in uh, diverse parts of the world or, or many parts of the world. Always has been, always will be until Jesus makes sets it all right, as well as famines. But this is only the first of the birth pains. This isn't the baby coming. This is just the first of the birth pains. When these things happen, watch out. In other words, be alert. Keep your eyes open. Be sober. I've, I've got several scriptures that I'm going to go into in the message um, today. But, but live your life watchful, not worrying. And there's a saying, I'll cross that bridge when I get to it. You don't know that you're going to get to that bridge. Some people try to cross the bridge before they get to it. Mom said, don't cross that bridge till you get to it. Um, and it, because, the meaning of that is... You don't know that you're going to have to go through that. So why are you trying to rush into it when you don't even know that's your path to begin with? Don't cross the bridge till you get to it. Uh, don't cross the bridge um, if you get to it or when you get to it. You don't know what's going to happen in the future. So don't worry. Even when it looks like it's time to worry, don't worry. God's got this. You, Christian, are a winner either way. Now, I know that's hard. It's easy when life is easy to say those things. It's hard when life is hard to say, I'm not going to worry. God's got this. I don't know why he's got it, but this I know. I am saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. And if this life overwhelms me, and it will, then I'm going home to be with the Lord. I'm a winner either way. If I stay, if God allows me to continue, 
then I'm going to continue working for his glory. If he chooses to let me pass, then I'm going to be with Jesus. I can't lose, Christian. And see, that's the mentality that Jesus is trying to get these disciples to look at. Guys, listen, don't worry about temporal things of the earth. Admire them. Be appreciative of them. Absolutely. But that's not going to change your life. What's going to change you is your relationship with, with Jesus and, and growing your faith life in him, being intentional about growing your faith in him. And I want to tell you, worry and doubt are two of the greatest killers of faith. And it doesn't necessarily have to be worry and doubt about yourself. Some people worry about other people or other things. Some people doubt not God, but themselves. And I'll tell you, I resemble that remark sometimes. I have no, no doubt about God's ability. What I have is doubt about my ability. Well, thank God I'm not saved by my ability. I'm saved by God's through faith. And, and so I've got to grow that faith. And that's what Jesus is trying to get. Guys, listen, don't worry about times. Don't worry about seasons. Don't worry about any of that. Don't worry. Focus. Be alert. Watch. Be on mission. You'll see that in just a minute. Um, when these things begin, you must watch out. You will be handed over to the local councils, beaten in the synagogues. You will stand trial before kings because you are my followers. But this will be your opportunity to tell others. Now, exactly what I just said, isn't it? Don't worry. Look for the opportunity. You're going to get audiences. You're going to be arrested. Maybe this is our lifetime. Maybe, maybe not. You're going to be arrested. You're going to be brought before kings. You're going to have audiences. You're going to, you're going to get like Joseph. You're going to be in the jail cell with, in prison with, with other people. You're going to have opportunities. Make those opportunities eternal ones, not temporal ones. Yes, you know, form relationships. Yes, be, be personal, be human. But at the end of the day, we're to be on mission with the gospel, the good news. And how's the rest of the world going to know it if you're distracted by the things of the world, by the worries of the world. Why, how, how, how is it that the world who is dead is going to be brought back to life unless we who are alive show them the way? Don't worry about these. Use it as, as an opportunity. Verse 10, for the good news must first be preached. And then, of course, it says to all nations. The good news, the gospel. Jesus loves. Jesus saves. There is hope for you, even if you feel hopeless, there is hope for you. The good news. Use your, your spot. Don't plan on what you're going to say. Just use your relationship. Use your testimony. Share that. Well, Brother Randall, my testimony isn't that impressive. Then get to growing. Get to growing. Mine wasn't either. I was just a little boy in the back seat of a Chevrolet Chevelle. For many years... And then I began to trust God. And as I trusted God, my faith began to grow. And as I took steps that were daring, in fact, horrifying in some ways, my faith grew through those. When I've been pushed into uncomfortable situations, which you just about have to push me into that, because I don't like them, that's where my faith grows. And that's where your faith grows. Because God comes through. Learned on Wednesday night, God's faithful. If he made a promise, he keeps his promise. You can count on it. God is faithful. And so the good news must first be preached. Tell it. Use your opportunities for the good news. Verse 11, but when you are arrested and stand trial, don't worry. <laughs> there it is again. I'm in jail. I don't want to be in jail. God's saying don't worry. Why? Why? Because I've got you. Jailed, not jailed. Hospital, no hospital. Health, unhealth. Jobless, beautiful job. I've got you. I've got you. Trust me. I'm not going to say that you're going to like everything that happens. But you're going to love the results. Watch out. Don't worry. Be sober. Don't plan on what you're going to say in advance. Just say what God tells you at the time. 
In other words, the Holy Spirit will take over. Happens every time. I, I know all of all of us preachers have various methods for the way we do things. Some, um, like um, Brother Wayne Weeks, which is one of my favorite men, um, he writes everything down. David Jeremiah does this. He writes everything that he's going to say down. And, and he says it. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Um, because at the moment that God gave it to him, that's what he was doing. I trust he's writing down what God says for him to do. I, on the other hand, study, 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 study. And then when it comes, and I have an outline of the scripture. And then when it comes time to stand in the pulpit, I trust the Holy Spirit to speak. And he does. Now that's the way I do it. All of us are different, but I just want to tell you, trust God. Don't lean on your own understanding. Don't lean on your own charisma. Don't lean on your own degree. Don't lean on, on who, who you are, who you have been. But let God speak through you. People don't need to hear you, preacher. People need to hear God. You don't have the, I don't have the answer. God does. But I know God. And I know because he's called me to preach that he will give the answer through me to you. I don't know your life. I don't know everything that's going on with you, but God does. And so he'll use me. And not just me. I'm just one of hundreds, thousands that he has that he'll use to make a difference in your life. Don't don't plan in advance what you're going to say. Just let God do it. As if it was not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit surrendered that takes faith that takes growth it takes submission it takes obedience i read this i believe maybe it was original to me i somehow doubt it but i maybe i read this at some point true faith is always proved by faithfulness true faith is always proved by faithfulness True faith is always grown by faithfulness. You do it one day at a time and it builds upon builds upon builds until at some point you have a testimony that is incredible, that's in, that is decidedly yours in that. It's like your fingerprint. No one else has exactly your testimony because your life circumstances is, is, are different in some ways many ways much different than mine your god's the same i hope but your testimony may be very different and that testimony grows we don't look for ways to grow our testimony we look for ways to trust god by not worrying and as we do that god comes through and that grows our testimony his actions grow our testimony finally um Brother will betray brother. Father will be betrayed by his own child. And children will rebel against their parents and cause them to be killed. Everything's going to fall apart. Social structure, as we know it. And in fact, in a lot of ways, we see this today. Maybe not as drastic. This is happening in some parts of the world. In fact, um, it's happening here uh, in some ways. But, but what I want to tell you is Jesus says, don't be distracted by that. Don't be distracted by that. In fact, he says, everyone will hate you. And wow, we see hate. Now, it's not just, uh, I don't want to become martyrized here. It's not just um, people hating Christians, although that is the flavor of the day in some ways. Um, People just hate. It's just a hateful time. But Jesus says, people will hate you because you are my followers. Not so much because of what they call you, but for what you do. You see what I'm saying? It doesn't say people will hate you because you're Christians. It will say people hate you because you follow me. Now I want to tell you, we crucify Christ. People will hate you, but keep going. Keep going, God's coming. If he doesn't come in the air, he's coming to get you at the last breath. God's coming. Be encouraged, church. But don't be diverted. 
Don't get out of focus. Don't step off onto the wrong path. Don't try to cross bridges till you get to them. Just trust God and use every opportunity to testify of His goodness. Love you guys. Happy Mother's Day. <laughs>